Welcome to Look Behind the Look, the new podcast that examines iconic looks in film, television, music, and fashion history. I'm your host, Tiffany Bartok. Hey, everybody. Happy New Year. Here we are, and it's really weird. It's already weird. But you know, we've been trained pretty well by now, so hopefully we're going to make the most of 2021 regardless of how it begins. I have been so excited to start the new year with this new episode. It's obvious why I'm so excited, because my guest is Lisa Eldridge, who needs no introduction, obviously. And I know these intros are always really gushy love letters, but I'm not going to apologize for that, because all of these artists are deserving of high regard. As you know, Lisa is an incredible makeup artist. You've seen her work on the cover of every magazine, and her celebrity clients are just too many to name. But she's also known to have an extremely high-end YouTube channel. This YouTube channel many aspire to recreate, and maybe they don't quite have the elegance and authority that Lisa has, so they don't quite succeed, but Lisa is the gold standard, and that's just me talking. I'm not giving side eye or anything. I'm just saying that she set the standard, and that's in everything she does. She has the brain of an encyclopedia when it comes to beauty history, beauty culture, and a scientific knowledge when it comes to products. Her book, Face Paint, was a New York Times bestseller, and if you don't own it, just know that your library is being judged by anybody who finds out. And, 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 just for a Christmas gift, just now, I received her lipsticks, which are truly extraordinary, and I am not just saying that because this glorious woman is a guest on this podcast. I'm saying it, I mean, she doesn't even know why I'm saying it. She doesn't know, she's not here. She doesn't know I'm saying this. So she's not even here for this part, and I don't have to say it. If you're listening to this on your podcast app, please remember that you can watch it. You can subscribe to the YouTube version at tinyurl.com slash LBTL YouTube channel. And that's where you can see all the looks that we're talking about and a lot more fun things. I also have a little giveaway going on on our IG. So head to look behind the looks IG and like and share if you feel so inclined. And enjoy this conversation with Lisa and I, the most down-to-earth woman in the world who does not have to be, she just is. Okay, I am here with Lisa Eldridge, who you all know and love, I'm certain, and I'm so (laughs) grateful that you took time to talk to us today, Lisa. Um, Oh, obviously, you're back to you and see you, Tiffany. So, I (laughs) will. I haven't seen you since um, the first Monday in May, maybe two years ago, here in New York. So it's just so lovely to see you. You were doing Dua Lipa. Uh, for that's the right. Met Ball. Yeah. Yes, that's the last time we saw each other. Yes. Wow. And I oh. remember, I remember we couldn't catch the cab. We were chasing the cab like physically through a construction site because <laughs> our, our Lyft or our Uber. And um, yeah, so it was, it was a lovely day in New York. Mm-hmm. And boy, things have certainly changed. How are you holding up in COVID? Have you traveled? At, you went to Milan no. recently. Yeah, I did go to Milan. I went to Milan at the beginning of the year, like in January. And then I went again when the lockdown lifted briefly. Uh Um, And that's been it. So yeah, I haven't been anywhere else. I mean, I have to say, I have quite enjoyed not going to airports and the whole check in thing. And you know, sometimes I've quite appreciated not traveling. I mean, the destination is different, because obviously, it's always amazing when you're there. But we do quite a lot of traveling and the makeup kits and the whole thing. I've just quite enjoyed having a break from that. And actually, I was almost in a frame of mind anyway before this happened. I want to travel a bit less because I feel like sometimes lots of the meetings and things we go to and, you know, things that you probably shouldn't really travel for, you know, with the climate in yes. mind, just the way it was getting like a little bit over the top. So, I had kind of decided anyway last year that I wanted to travel less, but it has been like totally nothing. But um, I was really feeling that and I've quite enjoyed not having to travel. Yes, I know. It's been strange. I, I mean, I, I long for the day when we can just Star Trek it and just teleport ourselves. And th- I think that's next. That'd be amazing. <laughs> just I would reach love that, that destination. <laughs> yes. Um, 
So Lisa, everybody's very familiar with your wall who watches your videos. Your claim to fame is obviously your uh, your extraordinary videos, as Troy Surratt calls them, my friend, the uh, the gold standard. You know, they are flawless, <laughs> flawlessly shot. And the tutorials are so, so, so popular. And um, I, I wanted to ask you how you got there, because... I know that many of the people listening have followed you from day one, but of course there are some that are just like, there's new, a new generation of people who are growing up with your videos and taking them for granted without knowing how you started. So can we start from the beginning? Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to be a makeup artist from about the age of 13 when I was given this book on stage makeup. Um, I'd been into makeup more for sort of painting, not putting it on, but using like my mum's old makeup to do what I now realise were face charts. But then I used to just think I was drawing like faces and using the makeup to create these uh, portraits, really. Um, and then a friend of my mum's got me a book about a Broadway actor's interpretation of like eight of the classic stage characters. And I was so obsessed with this book. I still have it. I read it probably like a thousand times. And it made me realize that you could be a makeup artist as a job because it wasn't like a publicized job then. Like it wasn't something that anyone ever talked about. Um, I knew that there was makeup artists for films and things, but I didn't really, or, or maybe even theater, but I didn't know that people did it like really as a job. Um, so I was just like, oh, I want to be a makeup artist. And I was just blown away by like, you could make yourself look so different with makeup. I was like, oh my God, this is like painting and drawing. I love faces. That's my passion. I like drawing and now I can, and I like using makeup to do the drawings, but now I can change people's faces with the makeup on the face. I was like, oh my God, how did I not know this? So I asked my mum to get me some stage makeup and like she took me wherever and we got some basic sticks. In fact, I had to ask the teacher because my mum was like, I don't know where that we get that. Um, and I asked the teacher and she got me some and I said, I'd love to do like the makeup for the plays in school. So then it was amazing because then we did a play and I made like a 13 year old boy look like an old man. And I was like, oh my God, this is like magic. It's literally like magic. And um, I was just like a master at highlighting and contouring, you know, by the time I was about 14, because we used to do all these, you know, it's just amazing what you can do with light and shade. So mm -hmm. I just loved it. But every time I said I want to be a makeup artist, people would be like, well, you have to work for the BBC then, because that's all anyone really knew. Like, it goes before the internet. So I used to love looking at Vogue and magazines, but mm -hmm. I just never knew how anyone could ever get to do the makeup for those things because I didn't know anyone in this right because where were you well, I was in Liverpool like okay. miles from London there was no scene there of anything and no mm. one that I knew in my family were all like makeup artists oh you know they'd have <sighs> clueless so if I asked at school they'd be like oh yes I think you have to go and work for the BBC um so I was like, we just didn't, we couldn't find any information about anything. And there weren't like makeup schools and things. So I decided I went, my first job, I went to work for my friend's dad had a beauty salon. So I thought I'm going to go and work in this beauty salon and see if I can like start practicing makeup on people. Maybe I'll just train myself if I've got enough faces like I was already doing my mom and my friends and stuff but so I went and did that to start with and then I did find a course but you had to do costume theatrical costume design and it had makeup with it right there it was all theatrical costume design and a teeny bit of makeup even though I said to them I just want to do the makeup they were like well you have to make the costumes as well so I think I <laughs> I did one like the Snow Queen or something. I mean, Ooh. I couldn't do costumes at all, but, you know, did the makeup and the headdress and all of that stuff. Um, and then I just thought, well, I'm going to have to move to London because nobody seems to be able to help me here. Nobody knows anything about anything. So I'll go to London and um, hopefully I'll figure it out when I get there. And I literally wow. just packed bags. I had no money. At what um, age was this? Oh, so by then I was like late teens. Uh -huh. Like I'd left school. I finished, I left school during my A-levels. 
um, because I I had to reshoot. I was supposed to be not reshooting. Listen, makeup artist for two many years. <laughs> um, I was supposed to be retaking my physics O level GCSE, as well as doing my A levels. And um, although I was loving doing the art A level, all of the maths retake and the physics retake, and I was like, why am I torturing myself with this? I don't want to do any of it. I want to be a makeup artist, so I'll just do that. I'll make I'll just make it work somehow. <laughs> So yeah, so I came to London and it was just a case of like slowly, slowly having to try and meet people that could help me or figuring out like I mean, how I, just, I can just see you hat in hand. <laughs> help me. <laughs> Literally like slowly, slowly meeting people. It was lit. I used to think of it like I haven't got this really high wall to get over I've got a really deep wall to go through Mm -hmm. like every time I made a contact it was a brick I was going this way through the wall or if I met someone that was like oh well my sister's cousin's auntie knows someone at this magazine or you know it's like so tenuous these links I'd be like well this could be a brick you know I could be this could help me um and it just slowly slowly kind of I got into like doing some testing and then I'd be doing various jobs as well. In the meantime, I was worked on a makeup counter. I worked in an architect's office. I was doing all sorts of, I worked as a, a temp receptionist, which was hilarious because I couldn't do any of the- I can't. I couldn't do any of the switchboard thing, but I said I could. <laughs> so that was stressful. <laughs> um, I was so determined and so like convinced that it was going to happen. I just thought, <laughs> I really want to do this and I love doing it. So it has to happen. Oh, I, I, what was the first job that you had where you felt like I can rest? I'm not searching so much anymore. You know, this is, this feels good and right. I remember like going to, I'd started to get my portfolio together in London. So I was testing like at the weekends and late at night and going on all sorts of tests where half the time you didn't like, you know, test shoots where half the time you didn't even get any images because the photographer. Oh my God lens cap off or something happened. <laughs> yeah. it was always something and then when you did get pictures of course it cost you so much money because you had to print them out to put in the physical portfolio and you know all of that stuff and um I remember like everyone was saying well if you go to Milan you get paid for tests and all of the new models start out there which is still kind of the case maybe not so much now but it was until recently that a lot of the new the new models go there so they are looking to get test shoots and, and things so so I just I literally rocked up in Milan I knew this girl so briefly who said my auntie lives in Milan and she'd be able to put you up for the first couple of nights oh my god no, I just rocked up in Milan and um, stayed with this lovely Italian lady I, I'm forever grateful to her basically um, and then I went to see these agents and they're all like oh my god we need a good makeup artist. There's not many here. So we'll pay like 25 euros per test. I was doing like three tests a day some days, but it was amazing because you get to cut your teeth. The the photographers were quite good because they were starting to sort of work their way in. And the models were obviously great models in waiting. So there was good models there. And And I even got like my first tear sheets there. And when I came back, I just felt like my book just looked so much more slick. Mm. And I felt like I could actually go and see agents and, and I got taken on then. What was the difference between the photographers that you found? You you're saying that they were a little bit easier to work with. Do you know what that was attributed to? I think that it was just a bit more, I think probably like myself, they'd started out in their home London or New York, wherever they uh-huh, started, uh-huh. and like I had, so it tended to be people that already done quite a lot of testing and were trying to get to the next level. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and there was kind of like people that I tested with in Milan during those years that like I then worked with on like Italian Vogue years oh, later. Wow. I remember doing a Moschino show, and the the stylist was like, "Do you remember me? We did a test shoot together." Like years ago and I was like yeah you know so it was quite interesting that it was it was quite um like a factory sort of vibe yeah. it. anyway it's, it's it's probably very different now but it was just nice because I got to try out so many work on so many different faces mm. 
doing that much testing, it's like just honing your skills, you know, and you're able to, I did location shoots, I did studio shoots, I did beauty shoots, I did like so much. And it was, mm -hmm. it was just so nice to be so immersed in it and with creative people all the time. Because in London, I was sort of having to work doing various jobs during the week and then try and test at the weekends or, so it was just so nice to be, um, in a situation where I was like thrown in, into Yes. It. And you felt like you were being fed instead of like searching and searching and searching and searching. Yeah, it yeah. was really, just really a, a, a great time. And I lived in about five different flats. It was so funny because I didn't want to stay with this lady for long. And then I met someone <laughs> like a nightclub. I mean, it's so risky, but like met someone in a nightclub and she's like, oh, <laughs> you met these English guys and they were like, oh, you can come and live with us. And I was like, okay. So like stayed with them for a while. Thank God it was all legit. And then I met this couple. <laughs> oh no, the first one after that was the lady I stayed with. She knew her nephew. So I paid to go and live in his apartment with his, him and his girlfriend. It was in a really posh area, but they used to have these massive fights every night, like Italian <laughs> style. They used to cook a big pasta and then scream and fight until about midnight every night. So I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> and then, then I met the English guys in a nightclub. Then I was staying with them and it was, yeah, it was quite a Lisa, mad, this mad is hilarious. Time. I cannot picture you in these situations. I can just see you with your little sheet over your eyes being like, yeah. oh, no. I know. It, it was quite mad. I thought it was quite funny. And every morning they'd be, then they'd make up and they'd be lovely. You know, it's just, they were just very like Italian and, you know, just these mad arguments going oh, on. Oh, I love it that. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. Oh my God. <laughs> That's when we discovered the earphone. Yes, yes, the earplugs. Yes, and then mm -hmm. did what was the yeah. what? When did you begin? Um, so you when you went from testing, and then did you get representation, and everything was then proper? Did you stay in Milan long? Yeah, I stayed there for three months, and then I came back to London, went to see. Ah, uh, so you got your you got your beautiful portfolio the way you wanted it, and then brought yeah. that back to London. Okay. And then I went to see like an agent that I really liked. It was quite a small agent, but they had, it was hilarious now when you think of it. They represented Guido, mm. Sam McKnight, Mary Greenwell. Um, who else? Like just wow. major people. They had, she yeah. only had like seven people on her books. And I wrote Those in The seven to like, have, right? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, I want to be a makeup artist. Maybe, you know, I thought maybe they'll get me to assist. And she was like, oh, your book's really good, you know. And I was like, well, I've been working my ass off in Milan. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and then they took me on, which was so exciting. And then it happened, started to happen after that quite quickly. I think because sometimes when, you know, I think my first big job was probably because Mary Greenwell wasn't available and Cindy Crawford came into town and I got to do her makeup for something. And then she liked me and said, oh, will you do my makeup every day that I'm here? So that was like my first kind of cover shoot and, I think it was, you know, I did lots of things with her that week. Um, and How did then, that feel to be wanted like that? Like, was that was just so the nice. best? Yeah. yeah, it was so lovely. And I, do you know what, before then, when I first joined the agency and they, I said, I want to do some, I want to assist Mary. Mm -hmm. And I remember her saying, you don't need to, you know, we're representing, you've got your book. And I said, you know what, I feel like, I've never actually been on a shoot with major people. Like I've done all these shoots with newbies, you know, and mm -hmm. they're all on my level. And it sounds weird, but I always say this to like young makeup artists. Sometimes it's nice to go on a shoot with somebody really big because you get to see how to behave. Like you don't know. I didn't know what to do if a supermodel or a world famous, do you treat them differently? Was there a, I, you know, I was like, I just love to do that. So I did one season with Mary and it was so okay. interesting. It was so for, interesting. For, and more so for the etiquette training. I mean, of course, Mary Greenwell yeah. is an incredible artist and it was beneficial <laughs> yeah, to see that. Yeah, but. Training, that's exactly what it is. And that's what I say to young makeup artists. You don't know what to do when you're on a shoot and Madonna walks in or this person walks in. If you've only been working with like, you know, starting out people that I had been, um, and of course I'd done the shoot with, with Cindy, but I just wanted like to be on, have that experience of being backstage at a show or, or with that level of, yeah. that level of client and all of that mm -hmm. and that level of photographer, you know, because 
to be in that situation is quite different. And actually, it's not different. I learned that it wasn't any different, but yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> nice to know, you know, and it's nice to kind of see people in action at that level with people at the t- absolute top of the business, top of the industry. And um, so I was really happy to do that. And I would say to Mary, you know, I'm still friends with Mary and we still see each other. And I would say, you know, it was, it was just so brilliant. And she gave lots of advice and things. She used to give like little talks of advice. And I'd be like, yeah, that all of that was so relevant and so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was how it kind of, that's how I got started. Really. Beautiful, beautiful. And then how did you find out about the world of the YouTube, Lisa, that you own? I was, <laughs> I was in a studio actually on a shoot and, um, this sounds really bad, but like a lot of people were watching some of the early YouTubers and thinking it was really funny. Like, uh-huh. in a slight, like oh my God, look at these amateurs, ha, ha, ha. When, and I was like, I'm sorry, this is amazing. <laughs> this is like, this is going to put us all out of business. And they yeah, and like, what year was this? Was this the year that people are like making a flower on their face yeah, and contouring it? Like 2009 or something. Uh-huh. 2008 maybe yeah maybe like 2008 actually Mm. and I was like this they were thinking it was quite entertaining I thought yeah it is entertaining but it's going to change the whole industry and I used to say that to people like um when I'd go on big shoots with advertising clients like beauty clients and I'd say well you know there's these girls on YouTube that can because I'd be sticking false eyelashes on claiming that it was the mascara and I'd say there's all these girls on YouTube that can say if it's good or not you know and they were like oh no we're a luxury brand it's nothing to do with us so anyway I was just really interested I thought it was so edgy I thought it was so brilliant I always say this I've said smart girl punk it was so punk the fact that they would just say calling it like it is and I used to say this is going to give the consumers all the power you make up companies are over now um and they'd be like you're you're mad but I just thought it was so wow it's incredible you know it was like I used to compare it back then to like the sea change that happened in makeup in the interwar years when makeup went from being something that you know you weren't allowed to wear and that was very much seen as being not chic and and all the rest of it to Hollywood and women starting to wear makeup which was the biggest sea change I'd seen ever in makeup or heard of and I used to say this is this is going to be comparable. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? It's YouTube. And I was like, no, honestly, this is comparable. I now think it's bigger than that. Um, but I used to say, no, 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 it's going to be huge. It is going to be huge. So I was so into it. I just thought it was lovely as well. I like watching people put makeup on. Yeah, and just thinking, meditative. Yeah. It was such a lovely vibe to it um honest I mean this is before like all sponsorships so people would go on and be like oh I love to wear this color every day and I wear it like this and I'd be like oh my god this is such a privilege you know I'm in I'm watching somebody put makeup on I'm overjoyed <laughs> I'm yeah. so thrilled this is amazing um and I just used to love like people would be sitting on their sofas and doing their makeup and looking at magazines and copying looks and I thought firstly it was a great way of getting intel about like what people like to wear, like regular women. It was like the best research and development you could ever do. Um, And I just thought it was really interesting. And it was just so, just, it was very creative. You know, it was something that was, was very outside of the norm and outside of the box. And I just thought it was great. So I was very curious and I, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, would I do that? And then I thought, well, I'll get such a bad reaction from the fashion industry. I know I'm going to be like everyone's going to be like criticizing me if I do it because it was considered like a funny thing in not a good way Mm -hmm. so um people didn't make fun of it so I just thought well I'll see so anyway in 2010 I was like I'm gonna do it I was basically worried about publicists seeing me and stop booking me for celebrities I was worried about um editors seeing it and stopping to book me um so in the back of my mind, I was worried about all those things that I would lose my career. But at the because same then, time... Because then you'd be categorized a YouTube mm-hmm. makeup artist. I see. Or they think like, oh, now Lisa does YouTube. She's like not really a professional. I see. Anymore. She's, 
gone down that route mm -hmm. we can't mm -hmm. really book her now for for artists we can't book her for big celebrities or magazine covers because she's in that category because there was a real snobbery around it it oh, was yeah. it was so intense so i just thought deep down i thought i just know this is right i don't know why i just trust this i feel it in my gut this is the right decision so 2010 i made my first video i didn't tell a soul not a soul <laughs> i was like so it went up and like people found it i don't know how like regular people found it and then then i thought i'll do about five of them like just explaining like some tips and things and then like everyone that was watching it was really into it and they were like oh you know make more and, and still no one in the industry knew no one no one ever said to me you make you no one had seen them there was like that for about two years they hadn't realized that I was doing it. And then in about 2012, I went on a really kind of cool editorial, like very edgy, very like the hottest, you know, shoot ever. And um, the stylists, who was it? The stylist assistant went to me, oh my God, I love your YouTube videos. And it was like slow motion. You know, in those films, when there's a pan in on your face, <laughs> yeah. and then, Ooh like that <laughs> and then i remember the hairdresser went you make oh, youtube no. videos oh no and i said yes but it's not for you it's for real people and, then I just <laughs> <laughs> and that was that and then i was like oh god it's gonna be out now oh well um i was like well i've got fifty thousand subscribers or whatever i had by then i was like i don't care um, that's, great. And, like, that's great and then I was worried like celebrities like no one ever mentioned that they'd seen me on YouTube and then I just remember like being with Kate Winslet on this job and I think we were at a house or something and like I'd been working with her for quite a while and we'd never really gone down that route and then this friend of hers turned up and she's like oh um oh this is my makeup artist Lisa you know this is so so she went Lisa makes the most amazing videos on YouTube and did it. Yes, and I was like, oh, I said, do you know about that? Do you know about those? And she was like, yes, my makeup artist in LA told me all about them and I, we all love them and everyone watches them. And I was like, oh my God. And I was like, oh, wow. And that was the first time like, I had good feedback. And then I realized, oh, it's fine. It's like, it, it's yeah. paid off. Like, by then I was like 2012, you know, it was... I was enjoying making them for one thing. I really well, that's liked what comes connecting. through. That's what comes through for sure. The effortlessness and the, you're so smart. I mean, it's just, you feel smarter after watching them and you just, <laughs> they really, really translate into, you know, a higher quality than, than, than you would get from a normal YouTube <laughs> video. I so you. I love hearing people's, you know, feedback. And I just think I feel very privileged to be part of such a nice community online. I've learned so much from my community. You know, they'll tell me about different brands that maybe I haven't heard of, or, you know, over the years, it's been absolutely fascinating for me just to yes. really grow this sort of community. And, and it's always been a very positive community. I've been very lucky that I haven't attracted, you know, kind of trolls yeah. and things, or trolls, whatever you call them. Um, and if anyone has ever been like that, you know, then my community usually like, oh, sorry, you're probably in the wrong place. You know, yeah, really there's definitely, really definitely, uh, it can definitely be ugly and hurtful and, and I, you know, crazy. So I, I, I mean, I'm sick every time I put a video up though, every time I take a video live, I still feel sick for a second. Do you get nervous? Like, you're yeah I'm yeah. like oh are they gonna like it is it a good look is this a good film like I always feel that sense of like, yeah always so I still feel like that nervousness sure well that's good that shows you care you know but yeah. it is it is true that and I've experienced that doing this is it's really difficult to get on the other side of the camera and though it might look effortless it is I mean, there's a lot of psychology that goes into thrusting yourself on the other side because we definitely prefer to be on the other side, <laughs> behind the yeah. camera. So much nicer. <laughs> but you've put all of your all of your beautiful um, research and history into the book, 
and it, it is extraordinary. And of course, I. What year did the book come out? Two thousand fifteen. Yeah, two thousand fifteen. It yeah. came out. Um, yeah, gosh, that's five years ago now. I can't. I can't believe, believe it. that. Crazy. Yeah. No, it's been. People still send me pictures of every day of buying it. It's still getting translated into different languages. Um, yeah, it's become quite a global thing. It's been really successful. It was a New York Times bestseller for three months, which I never expected. So it was, um, you know, it's just a passion product, a project for me. I mean, 100%. It wasn't anything other than that. Um, and I think people were quite surprised that I hadn't done like a how-to makeup with, you know, coming out of the YouTube thing. Um, but I was always really interested in the, the history. So I felt like that was more of a, a good fit for me. For yes. The first book. It's absolutely it. beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And um, then you made the lipsticks after that, which are, I mean, this is crazy. This is like not even a decade. You've got lipstick jewelry, a New York Times bestseller, <laughs> um, a jillion subscribers on YouTube. I mean, it's it's a lot of beautiful things and I don't know how you even took the time to talk to me. So now I will get into what we are here for, which is talking about Ava Green and you working together on Dumbo, which yeah. I just watched again last night with um, Jason Jackson. We saw it in the theater. It's absolutely gorgeous, of course. And I know you've made a, a beautiful video about behind the scenes, um, not behind the scenes, but you know, how you assembled that look. And so I, I just had a couple more questions about the collaboration yeah. process. Mm -hmm. And um, let me see, I, I had, I took note. I felt like I was going to school. My son asked me if I was studying for a test. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm talking to Lisa tomorrow <laughs> and she knows her stuff. So um, <laughs> on the team with you was Mona Ferguson and Ola Carroll and Elaine mm -hmm. Pichon. Yes, Alain. Okay. I wanted to ask you how all of you work together with Colleen Atwood and Tim and mm -hmm. Ava. That's a lot of creative minds in one place. And I wanted to break down sort of the process of like um, how you try things, how, who comes up with the first idea? How do you put it in place? Yeah. So, um, so I was first contacted by Colleen. Um, obviously she cleared it with Tim and she contacted myself and Alain and they wanted us to design the look. So we wouldn't be going on the shoot every day, but we'd be the sort of makeup designers, which means that you just devise the looks really. Um, and the reason that she wanted myself and Alain, or from my, from my point of view, is because they wanted it to have a historical element but also to be quite high fashion and runway and maybe have a bit of fashion in there so they didn't want to hire like a movie makeup artist they wanted to get somebody that was more of a makeup historian slash slash fashion type person that's you um so so that was it so i was really excited and initially um it was just coming up with the ideas in my mind so hearing from Colleen, having calls with her, what year it was going to be set in, what the costumes were going to be like, what Ava's character was going to be. Um, and then having a set of ideas. And then I did some research and I've got this amazing book, which is actually at my house. Damn it, I've forgotten to bring it in. But I've got a scrapbook from um, roughly the same period in 1919. And it's just, it's a it's oh it's adorable. It's a great big scrapbook, and it's somebody that has I presume a girl I don't know has collected images of all her favorite silent movie stars and all her favorite theater music hall sort of stars. And she made all these collages and she's painted them in. And so I, I kind of used that book and I used various other research that I had, and then thinking about. Ava's face and Ava and so the first lot of practices were done on a model so this is before we get cracking so it was just myself and Alan so we went to had you worked with Alan had you worked with Alan yeah, before I, yeah I had I had and I knew like his wigs and attention to detail was like oh, unbelievable incredible. So I knew that it was going to be something else um so yeah so Alan and I were in Pinewood Studios 
and we had a model. So we were in there for, I forget how many days, but we were just trying out looks. So we try a look, we take it off. He tried a bit of hair. We try another makeup look. Um, and also at that stage, I hadn't worked through my ideas with Ava. So I wasn't sure how far she'd want to go mm. because quite difficult you don't want to make an actress uncomfortable um you know whether it's bleaching eyebrows or wanting to pluck eyebrow all kind there's all kinds of things that you need to work with the actress with as well so I tried out all various looks on this um on the model and it was quite fun because um every now and again like Colleen and her team would like take pictures and then I'd be like mm, not sure about this one I want to keep going. And then when I got to a point where I'd say, mm, I think this might be the look and that would take days or hours or whatever. It could take a long time. Um, and I must say the first thing I did when I got there was Colleen took me around the airport sized costume department. And I was, I think they all thought I was a competition winner. <laughs> we all laughed because there was all these people there sewing, you know, movie costume assistants, people, seamstresses. They'd been there for a year already making. Oh, they were shit. like, they were like, what? Who is this girl? She's like hysterical. Yeah. But I yeah. was like, oh, I, I was like, oh my god, because there was just rows and rows and rows of the most amazing costumes. And Colleen's so cool anyway. She was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we've been here a year. And the costumes, yeah, they're pretty good. And I was like, good. I'm like, I'm, I'm hysterical because it's so amazing. I'm so inspired. Um, and you're I a huge it. fan of Tim Burton. So you knew her, her work yes. so well. Oh, my God. I probably... was like literally the competition. I was the competition winner. I love it. I was so uncool, like beyond uncool. Uncool. And then, <laughs> I was, I was, so, I was so geeky and like weird. Um, and everyone was so like casual. Uh, but yeah, and then we kind of like went, so if I'd get to a stage where I'd be like, I think this could be one of the looks. And then Alan would be like, mm, let me try. And then we said, okay, we think this is the look. So then they'd call Tim. So then Tim oh would God. come in. And he, he would sit down and look like this. At the model. Yeah, but it would go on for ages. And then he'd go like right, left, happy there. Like, anyway, he was like, yeah, 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 that could work. Yeah. Maybe. <gasps> so the whole time that he's staring, you're not sure what's going on in his genius no, mind. No, he's thinking of his lighting. And I'd already mm. been, um, they'd already shared with me the grading and the, the design, the you know, the production design, and I'd seen all of Tim's original drawings and paintings. They were all up around the walls. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was phenomenal in itself. Um, so I was like, really wanted to step up and like be like, do something amazing. Anyway, so that all went well, and then we kind of got to the point where we had like several different ideas for the first two looks. And then it was like, okay, so now we're going to do it with um, Ava. So then we'd go back and like, we then we'd have like some days with Ava. And had then, you worked with, had you worked with Ava before? I had worked with her before, but I didn't have the relationship with her that I do now. Right, like I'm now course. we're like super close, but um, so anyway, I was just, you know, and I was really studying her face. I was oh. like, literally like this like the whole time I mean I made even Tim look less intense but I was like you know and I was really like watching all the angles and staring mm. at her and trying things and I'd be behind her all the time going like I was like a sort of gremlin on her shoulder but anyway she was really <laughs> into it. she was like oh my god your attention to detail is unbelievable and I was like with your lip shape and I want to change this and change that and just do this and oh. anyway Dream face, dream face, dream face, dream girl, love her so much. Um, and we were so on the same wavelength and we kind of figured out that um, some of the more extreme looks, shall we say, that I'd had in mind, like involving eyebrow manipulation hmm. was actually not going to work because she would be going between scenes on one day and then it probably would not work. So we had to kind of work with her natural face, which is amazing anyway. So that then you know gave me cause to think like how to treat the eyebrows and how to 
work with with the rest of the face. So, so yeah. And again, Tim came over, um, and then we sort of narrowed it down. And I had this idea to do the patch, you know, on her face with the yeah. like Georgian patch, the sort of 18th century patch, because it was an affectation. Um, became very fashionable again at the turn of the century amongst sort of aristocrats for fancy dress parties. So I was like, I really want to add that. Um, and I'd spoken to this company, um, Face Lace, that had made, were going to make me some custom sizes and things. So, and Tim was like, not sure. And I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and like make them and see what you think. So anyway, we got the first two looks down and then they started filming and we actually then did, went back to do another look and then went back to do another look. Um, and then it was really just working with, um, of course, Mona and, um, you know, explaining the Ola. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, well, Mona, Mona and Ola, yeah. Yeah, Mona, Mona was makeup though. So yes, it was for right. me, it was like, right. Right, right, right. About, like, you know, how I saw the makeup and then she would come and we'd do the look and then she was there on the days the model came and she'd come at the end of the day and I'd be like, I think this is what I want to do, but I'm not sure. Anyway, she was super nice and... Um, and, and all of that. And I had some weird makeup stuff that maybe wasn't really available. So I was able to like share with everything with hair, some colors that were discontinued and stuff that I was really into using and, and some pigmenty type lipsticks that I'd mix. So I wanted to kind of, you know, make sure that we using the same sort of products and things. So that, that was all really good. And then on the first day of filming, or no, the screen tests, the screen tests, oh my God, that was so cool. So I went back, Ava. first two looks, yeah. So it was the look with the, um, when she first gets out of the car with the, the big entrance. red, slightly 1940s big over the top wig and the entrance look. And we did the gold look the first day okay. that I did screen tests. And that day, Tim was like, I'm not sure about the patch. And I was like, I said, yeah, but just think all these people are going to go to fancy dress parties in the future and they're going to go as her and they're going to need the patch to make it. I was like, Gig's trying to like sell it. And he was like, yeah, it could work, it could work. <laughs> I was, and he was like, no, it could work. Let's try it. Let's try it. And he said, let's let's just try it in the um, um, the mouche, as they used to call them, of which course. were the, the 18th century, you know, where you wore it meant which who you voted for and whether you were married. Or and Ava or loved or it. Had, she, yeah, she like, loved oh, that. I I love that. that. Yeah, she said, I love it. I really want it. So um, I'd had so many different sizes made because I thought, well, I wanted to show up because it's I like it. Um, but I don't want to like, obviously, if Tim doesn't like it, that's fine as well. So I had like, you know, this many millimeter size made and that many millimeters. I had so many of them. Anyway, we did the screen test and um, Tim was like, oh, I really like it. It looks really good. Oh, you know, thank make God. It. So I was like, yeah. Um, and we were really happy with the screen test and Ava loved the makeup and she felt really comfortable. And um, so, yeah, I definitely had to pinch myself on the um, on the screen test moment, you know, with the clapperboard when they say like Tim Burton. And I was like, this is so cool. I'm like, ah, competition winner. <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with moments like that and breathe them uh, in like that? I, I tend to get uh, so... Uh, I, it's like a surge of emotions and I don't, I hadn't have to practice holding on to the, to it instead of just like freaking out, pushing yeah. it away. I think I just make myself really take it in, yeah. like, forget, like look at everything and like really remember like this moment and this scenario and this mm. scene and you're at Pinewood Studios and there's Colleen and there's Tim and like everything's so amazing and there's Ava and that's my makeup and that's a screen test like just to to drink it all in you know and make sure that you have like a, a mental snapshot of everything oh it's so beautiful I, I can just see how you felt and thinking about that book that you first got and how like this would be in that book today you know yeah, totally. what you created yeah. oh yeah it was, it was so it was so nice I was so so happy when you when you nail that look at the screen test do you get scared like about recreating it for the film <laughs> you know yeah. like oh my god what did I do how do you keep track yeah. of exactly what you did because it's quite different than editorial where it's just magic right yeah no definitely I mean Mona was great because I only went on the first day of filming for the the entrance day 
And on that day, um, they asked me just to observe, not to do the makeup, to make sure that we had the look ah. nailed. So Mona actually did the makeup and I would just say, oh, I- Interesting. I pulled out the liner a little bit or I did this or whatever. Um, so that was fine. You know, it was kind of, that was that was how it, it was done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then after that, you know, Mona did an amazing job and, and then we had to go back again. It was so funny going on a film set because you've got to be there at 5 a.m., you know, ready to do the makeup with in fashion was so spoiled, you know, I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> I know. I mean, it happens occasionally in fashion, but not very often. And certainly not with celebrities for like cover shoots and things. Um, and then I went back again to do the no makeup look when she's got the little black bob on. Yes. And then went back again to do When she comes into the tent, she comes into the tent. Yeah. To like, yeah. Like, um... yeah. With the sort of rougey cheeks and everything. Yes. And you went back again to do um, like a silver look. I forget, it was a silver costume. I think I've forgotten now which one that was, which scene that was. That's at the end. Um, yeah, so maybe that was another, that was another look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we and kept And then the red back. dress and the, and then the, the gold um, oh, yeah, the red eyebrow. Dress, the red dress, the red that, dress. Was, that was a lovely look. Oh, oh my incredible. God, that was so nice. And by then they were doing the internals up at, um, they weren't in Pinewood anymore because it was another set for the inside. Of the I was going to ask you about that. Um, so yeah. they, for the press, they don't extract the images from the movie. Of course they, they pose it. Yeah. Like a magazine shoot. Right. And so do, do you, can you come up with a new look at this point or do you hearken back to the looks in the film? How does that process look? Yeah. And no, we had to definitely like, cause they hadn't just hadn't filmed those looks yet. Yeah. So right. Before they filmed those looks. So if she'd only, the two looks that we filmed were the ones that were going to be in the sequence filmed first. And then it was the other three, the silver, the silver, the red, the gold, the no makeup and the arrival. So there was like five main looks. Um, so yeah. And even, you know, that's all really interesting as someone that works mainly on fashion shoots. It's just so different, isn't it? With the continuity and, you know, the way film, the film industry works and. Um, yes, absolutely. And then. Well, then there's the world of the premiere where what how do you come up with the looks for the premiere is Ava like I want to do this do you come up with the ideas together or do you and do you echo the film yeah no we didn't echo the film at all um, yeah we didn't want to echo the film because um Ava loves makeup and she loves experimenting with makeup and strong makeup and you know she loves that transformative power of makeup so we were just having fun you know we were doing a smoky eye black one day then we we're doing big blue eyes the next day then we were doing like I forget we did so many different looks on the sort of press tour and it was just so much fun um, to be able to just play around and, and, and try so many different things with her and all her costumes, you know, her outfits for all of the press tour were amazing as well. So that was really exciting. Talked about absolutely everything that we can talk about, Lisa. Are you exhausted? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to talk to you so much, but your life is so rich and full. And I <laughs> wanted to touch on all of it. I was greedy. I was greedy with oh, you, Lisa. It's been such a pleasure. I mean, I love chatting to you anyway, Tiffany. And I, you know, I love talking about makeup and I'm just as passionate about it today as I was with my little book in my bedroom, age 13, practicing. So nothing's changed really. Oh, thank you so much for talking to me today, Lisa. Oh, I can't wait. Thank I'll talk so to much. you again. I'm going to trick you into doing yeah. another one of these. Oh, anytime, anytime. It's lovely to chat to you. Take care. You too. Thank you so much for listening, you guys, as always. And please continue spreading the word if you like what you hear and see. Enter the giveaway on the IG, look behind the look. We're so happy when you let us know that you're enjoying what we're doing. It really means the world to us to see your comments and ratings and reviews. And we see them all. Until next time. Look Behind the Look is a Vinyl Foot production written by me, your host, Tiffany Bartok, produced by Jace Bartok, and produced and edited by Kelly Riley, with audio engineering by Nicole Tucker. If you're interested in learning more, find our video version on the YouTube channel, Look Behind the Look Podcast.
There you can see rare photos and clips from our guests. And please follow us on Twitter at Look Behind Pod and Instagram at Look Behind the Look. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. And tell your friends and spread the word. You can subscribe to us on iTunes or any podcatcher of your choice. Thanks for listening to Look Behind the Look.